This is a coastal cannon from England and this one's more than 300 years old. It weighs five tons and it's made of solid cast iron. Let's go and have a look at the way in which they were made. They started by making a mock cannon out of wood, rope and clay and then placing it in a bed of sand, special casting sand which was pressed all around the cannon, it's built up halfway here, and continued to be pressed around the cannon in the second half on another frame. It's a brick frame as you can see. The brick frames were held together by solid iron bands and then the whole device was heated in order to harden the casting sand. Now after this had been done, the two halves were separated, the mock cannon was taken out and through a small opening in the top here, molten metal was poured in. After that had cooled down and solidified, they broke the thing apart as you can see here and they ended up with this, the cannon, very heavy, made of solid iron. It was so heavy, in fact, that they needed special devices consisting of chains and pulleys and ropes in order to lift the cannon out. And indeed, they were so heavy, it wasn't easy to move them around. And it certainly wasn't easy to move around cauldrons of molten metal. So sometimes cannon were cast here, in a pit of sand in front of the furnace. And when the iron had melted, the gate was opened and the metal poured straight into the, the moulds down there. When it solidified, the solid cannon were once again lifted out by hoists and cranes. Now sometimes in the smaller cannon, the hole for the barrel was cast in the one operation. But for the best cannon, the truest cannon, it had to be drilled out. And that was done after a bit of finishing. Much of the finishing occurred here with the forge and the tilt hammer. The forge had a charcoal fire which was brought to a very high temperature with bellows. And the object to be treated was heated and then brought out carefully with tongs and placed under the hammer and beaten into shape. In this way, the shape and finish of cannonballs was improved and also with this hammer, the bands that went around the cannon mould were made. And it was here that the importance of water power becomes evident. That water wheel is driving through a system of cogs both the tilt hammer and also the bellows which keep the forge hot. And water power was also used in the drilling of the cannon barrels. So the water wheel was fixed a large drilling bit, and that came out in this direction. The cannon was placed on a carriage. The carriage had wheels, and they ran along rails, and the whole thing was very accurately guided forward. So the cannon could be chocked up into position, uh, settled very nicely, so that the bit came and met it dead centre, and then began to drill out the hole through which the cannonball ran. But it was a slow process. You can imagine if the bit uh, jammed in the middle of it, the whole thing had to be melted down and uh, you had to start all over again. Many bits were replaced in the drilling of one cannon. Well, for most cannon, the gun was kept still and the bit was turning. But mortars were drilled in a different fashion. The mortar was short and fat and used to lob cannonballs over a fairly short distance, high in the air and down on the target. And here's how it was made, on the mortar lathe in which the solid hunk of metal, the solid mortar, was firmly attached to the water wheel, the whole thing rotated, and then the boring tool was slowly wound into the mortar itself, cutting a hole in the centre. Because the cutting tool was firmly attached to a flat bed, it was a very accurate method of boring. And it was used not only for the mortar, but also for the large coastal cannon. In fact, with this method, you could make a cannon that was so accurate that it could land a 32-pound cannonball accurately on a target at a distance of three miles.